Well, look what we have here. You might want to have like a sense of skill of what you're looking at. <laughs> this is a quantum tunneling composite, pretty nanoscopic. Uh, it's a very tiny three and a half by three and a half by one millimeter piece of what just feels like kind of plastic foam. And um, in this video, I'm going to tell you exactly why this is interesting for electronics. So essentially what we have here is a tiny piece of material that responds very, very strongly to compressive forces. The whole idea behind this is you, you have these things called force dependent resistors, and those are little pieces of essentially just metal. And metal has this inherent property that if you compress it, it becomes thicker, so cross-sectional area becomes larger and it conducts electricity better. Its resistance goes down. Uh, this is generally how the um, piezoelectric effect or uh, piezoresistive effect is explained. So this, in this case, this piezo ceramic, it's exactly the same effect for the piezoresistive effect. So you have a material which you can compress or contract. And what you can see here on the left is it's in its elongated form. In its elongated form, it's obviously it's longer and it's thinner than when it's compressed here on the right. So the effect, like both the elongation and the thinning effect, cause its resistance to go up. So you can see this, this kind of effect. This is what causes materials to change resistance when they're compressed. And the, the big issue here is that for any material that's a conductor, that's a reasonable conductor, so all metals, but also for instance, carbon, these materials cannot be compressed that much. That there's, they are simply too stiff. And if you compress them more, they, they will just crush and they will not go back to their original state. So why are QTCs, I mean, quantum tunneling composites, they're essentially plastics but they're plastics with an additive that gives them this effect. Uh, why is that such a different effect from the piezoresistive effect? As you already kind of guess from the name quantum tunneling composite, this all has to do with quantum tunneling. So what is quantum tunneling? And this, uh, this subject is it's just a lot of fun because in uh, high school, uh, my final project was about a device called the scanning tunneling microscope, which is a microscope that works on the principle of electron tunneling. And uh, I'll show you a little clip. It's, it's, we made um, a movie about it. It's terrible, but also it was just so much fun. The world as we can see aan bepaalde wetten. As ik deze bal opgooi. <laughs> Van de tunnel hebben, een klassiek systeem. En je zou mm, gaan kijken naar een berg die er zo uitziet. Oké? Okay? Nou uh, zet je een, uh, uh, je, je, je zet je leerling hier neer met een voetbal en die voetbal geeft hij een schop. Doe het. Ja. ja. So the whole idea behind quantum tunneling is that on the quantum level, so on really tiny scales, if you're looking at if like this whole screen were only the size of a couple of atoms, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle really comes into play. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you can never exactly know the location and the velocity let's just call it velocity for now, I know it's not quite technically correct, of a particle. So there is this trade-off between knowing, measuring one property and the other property. And this is not a consequence of the measurement. This is not a measurement error. This is not something we can fix with better engineering. This is a fundamental property of everything on the quantum level. There's just this inherent inaccuracy in where it is. And this has some very weird effect. We can see like this vertical line. This is our nominal location of, for instance, an electron. But the 
actual electron can actually be pretty much anywhere on this x-axis. And the probability that it is in a certain location, uh, you can graph this with this probability curve. So uh, the probability that it's really far from its nominal location is pretty low, but it's not zero. And the, the closer you get, obviously, there's a higher probability that it's going to be here. So let's say this electron here is very close to a physical barrier. And this physical barrier, that's this, uh, I guess, magenta area. And the physical barrier is something that it cannot penetrate. However, because there is an uncertainty in where it is, there is a possibility that this electron here on the left can tunnel through, it can instantaneously change location from left of the physical barrier to right of the physical barrier. And this, this is essentially all this. This is all that is quantum tunneling. And the smaller this physical barrier is, the higher the probability that it will just jump over. This is one of the reasons why electronic silicon uh, microchips cannot become much smaller because as everything moves closer together on the chip, you get these leakage currents that increase exponentially because these probability spaces become so close together that things just spontaneously tunnel over. Now, another thing that's really important to keep in mind here is that this tail here this, this still is extremely long. In real microchips, we are already having problems with excess tunneling current when things are about 10 atoms apart. So you can imagine this tail, I mean, it looks like this tail is very low here, but this is still a very high probability. It's not a high absolute probability, it's only 0.0000001% or something, but there are 10 to the 10 to the 18 or 10 to the 20 electrons that interact with the physical barrier on, for instance, a microchip, there are just the, the amount of material there is to be tunneling over is just so gargantuan that even a very small probability uh, can pass a high current. So if you look how this pertains to quantum tunneling composites, what we have here, the, the whole thing about a quantum tunneling composite, it is just a plastic. It's a piece of, I think, polyurethane or something like that. But there are these very small particles, tiny nanoscale particles of very spiky, uh, I think it's nickel. These spikes are what enables this quantum tunneling effect. Because normally, if you have a uh, polymer material, and you put in uh, metal, for instance, to improve its uh, heat conduction or even electrical conduction. Uh, these particles are essentially round when they go in. So if they get closer together, uh, you don't have that much surface area that comes close to each other. But with these spikes, like these spikes kind of interlock with each other as the material is compressed. And this causes uh, this tunneling effect to be very, very strong between the spikes of adjacent particles. But what actually happens in a QTC is that not all the particles are equal. Uh, they don't cause conduction pathways everywhere. There are these specific pathways that open up, and as some particles become closer together, they can close a new pathway that conducts even better. But there is still uh, this this effect, uh, single pathways open up, and like if the material only deforms a tiny bit in, for instance, this left pathway in the middle, then this pathway can be broken up, and there are only a couple of pathways here. So if only one, one of, for instance, three pathways breaks up, even though you only changed the deformation of the material a tiny bit, the actual resistance of the material goes up a lot. And this uh, effect is kind of a continuous uh, process in the material. So just to show you how, how strong this effect is, I've got here, here in the middle, it's, it's very hard to get this on the camera. I have two PCBs here, and I put a little bit of uh, QTC material uh, 
in between these PCBs. One PCB is connected to this wire, one PCB is to the other, and I'm measuring the resistance. And as I push down, like right now, it's it's this overload on the resistance scale. So it's essentially infinite resistance. And as I push down, you see it's now a couple of mega ohms and I push harder and it now goes into the kilo ohm range is a couple tens of kilo ohms. And if I push really hard, I can get it to go down to low ohms range. If I get really hard, I can I can get down to less than one and a half ohms, but I can, that was like 20 kilograms of pressure or something. So let's look at this effect, which is called percolation uh, in practice. So here we have a fairly heavy container and let's just make some contact. And we can see it starts at about one and a half mega ohms and it just flops around. I'm, there's absolutely no movement in the table or anything, but you see this effect of pathways, conduction pathways being created and destroyed. It's all already at like 500 kilo ohms. It's actually surprisingly stable. <laughs> no, it's, it's going down a lot again. Yeah, and there, there you go. It's, it's suddenly gone from more than a mega ohm to like 200 and something kilo ohms. And I bet you it's going to go down to like the tens of kilo ohms at some point. Four and a half minutes in and we're it's still the resistance is still going down. It seemed to be kind of stable at 220 kilo ohms for a while, but uh, now it's just gone down a lot. I don't I don't know where it's going to uh, stop. Now, of course, another issue with uh, quantum tunneling composites. I mean, it's really nice that they uh, respond so strongly to compression. But one of the downsides to that is that if surfaces between which this QTC is uh, sandwiched to be really coplanar, so they're, they're perfectly parallel, because if one of the corners of this QTC is just slightly more compressed than the rest, that corner is going to be ever so slightly closer together and it will conduct so much more that it just has this overwhelming that it drowns out the resistance signature of the rest of the material. So it's it's just really hard to uh, get such a QTC to respond linearly to a certain load. Now, one thing I found is that if you just remove the load and kind of reset everything, it does tend to reset to some neutral value uh, fairly well. So uh, one of the possibilities you can use these QTCs to do some kind of linear force measurement is to just have a certain to, to add the load. Does it start? <laughs> it doesn't even start. This might just be oxidation on the context, by the way. Well, anyway, <laughs> it, it seems to be completely non-functional now. Oh, there we go. You add the load, you wait for a certain number of seconds, then you take a measurement and then you remove the load again and just repeat for a couple of seconds. And I've actually gotten reasonably uh, good results with that. And I will show you a plot on the screen of the resistance versus force that I found. So yeah, this is basically all I can tell you about this. This was really fun. I got this uh, QTC material. It was sent to me by tweakers.net user Silent7. Thank you very much for that. It was really fun to find this because like at first I thought, well, it's just just something fun to look at and maybe take a couple of measurements, see how it responds and that's it. But it actually turned out to be a pretty, like it was a super interesting uh, type of material. And it kind of harkens back to the interest that I had in quantum tunneling in, the, uh, in high school. And it's of course cool to see nanotechnology and to see 
this effect that it has on microchips development in like something microscopic. Yeah, it's still it's still a tiny tiny little piece of material, but it's a macroscopic effect. I can I can put force on it, and I can see the effect of quantum tunneling in a material. That's really cool. So uh, I hope you like it. Oh, there it starts again. <laughs> anyway, see you later. Wat voor kaartje.